Good morning, good morning. Welcome everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you so much for being here. We're gonna get started in just a minute here. Wonderful. All right, we've already got 52 folks here. Good to see you all bright and early. Thank you for being here with us on your Thursday morning. I hope you brought your big uh, big mug of coffee with you today so that you're feeling very alert and ready to engage with the great data and the event that we have for you this morning. All right, got some more folks coming in from the waiting room. We'll give them a, just a second to join and then we'll, we'll jump right in. Wonderful. Well, I want to go ahead and start by just welcoming everyone to the space. I'm so excited to see you all here. Uh, excited to talk about serving children and families. My name is Ramona and I am with MIG. I'm a project manager and I'm here to support this event and I'll be emceeing for you this morning. We're going to go ahead and talk about um, our agenda for this morning, and we're just really excited to have you here as we relaunch the Contra Costa Children's Leadership Council. This morning, we'll be reintroducing the Children's Leadership Council, then we'll hear opening remarks from Supervisor John Joya, Chair of the Board of Supervisors of Contra Costa. Then we get to hear a special report about the opportunity gap for children across Contra Costa. Following this, we'll have a panel discussion with some experts, some local experts, and then we'll move into a group discussion where we get to hear from all of you. Finally, we'll invite you to join the Children's Leadership Council convening on June 21st. And then we'll close right on time because I know how busy everyone's schedule is. Just a few uh, Zoom logistics for you. I know probably this is old hat for many of us, um, but I think it always helps to, to revisit. Uh, you have the chat box, which is enabled for this meeting. And we wanna encourage you uh, to go ahead and share your thoughts in the chat. In fact, I'll ask you to find the chat now and go ahead and put your name, um, your agency, your, your pronouns, and why you're here in the chat box. So again, that's name, agency, pronouns, and why you are here, just to get us warmed up and make sure that everybody has the chat box. <laughs> we are also um, encouraging you, if you want, to use reactions during this meeting. Uh, for the most part, folks will be on mute, but if you would like to share a verbal comment, you can go ahead and raise your hand and then we'll call on you so you can unmute and share. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ruth Fernandez from First Five of Contra Costa to reintroduce the Children's Leadership Council. Go ahead, Ruth. Thank you so much, Ramona, and good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Ruth Fernandez, and I'm the Executive Director with First Five Contra Costa, and I'm just really excited uh, to welcome all of you along with Ramona. Um, it's really great to see so many organizations represented here today. 
Uh, I know we have community-based nonprofit organizations in the audience, county departments, local and state government representatives, philanthropy, education, health, childcare, and many more. It really does feel like the Village for Children has showed up, so we thank you. Um, we would like to start uh, our day and the program this morning by just providing a brief uh, overview of how the Contra Costa Children's Leadership Council began. So the council was originally launched in, in, in 2019 as a collective action effort to really address the inequities and needs faced by our county's children and families. And uh, to start that work, several county agencies came together to lead the effort. Uh, that includes First Five Contra Costa, the Contra Costa Employment and Human Services Department, Contra Costa Health Services Department, and the Contra Costa County Office of Education. And over the course of the year, um, uh, in 2019, we included many other individuals and organizations from several entities, cities, service providers, elected officials to join the effort. Uh, we met uh, over four large convenings in the first year where we all came together really motivated by a shared goal to define ways to improve outcomes for our children and really looking at a life course trajectory of children prenatal to age 25. The council's initial work in this first year yield multiple goals and, and a collective action purpose. Um, during this initial phase, um, we also identified an intentional purpose to develop and strengthen a community that recognizes and supports child, youth, family, and community resilience and well-being. That was our North Star. There was also recognition that uh, we must continue to work collectively to do better at coordinating services and resources, that we have an opportunity to disrupt structural marginalization and also to disrupt systemic silos that make experiences for children and families a lot more complicated, bureaucratic, and often even harm inducing. Lastly, uh, there was also recognition during our time together in the first year that we had many opportunities for collective action and that we can really move together to make a lasting effect in the life trajectory and success and well being of children. For example, looking at policies locally that can change children's conditions. The council took a pause during the pandemic, and today, we are excited to relaunch this important collective action effort. Um, we know one thing, uh, the pandemic showed us that the inequities that existed prior to COVID were only magnified and that this is an urgent work. This is really an urgent call to action for all of us. So um, our goal is to resume the Children's Leadership Council's work through multiple uh, tangible steps. One being um, learning and connecting with local work correctly, cur currently on their way um, through many initiatives and coalitions that focus on children's needs and issues. We know that many things happened over the last three years and throughout the pandemic. Uh, many of us uh, launched into partnership and collaboration, looking to really sustain and um, ensure our families uh, had what they need during the pandemic. So. Uh, there's a lot that has transpired, and one goal of ours through the council is to reconnect and learn about all of this work that is currently in the works. Many of you here today are actually leading that work. Secondly, we want to identify tangible opportunities for us to work collabor collaboratively on specific policy changes that can lead to improved children outcomes, as I said before, uh, here in Contra Costa County. And thirdly, to explore how to center our collective and individual work for families uh, on current lived experiences. And uh, we know that centering community voice and lived experience was also a core value that came out of our work um, in 2019. 
So before we close today, later on, I will be sharing more on how to connect and participate in the Le Children's Leadership Council later this year. Um, so stay tuned, uh, more information before we leave today. Uh, to that end, now it's my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, uh, the Chair of Contra Costa County Board of Supervisors, John Joya. Supervisor Joya has been a champion for children uh, and a supporter of the council from its inception. So uh, welcome and thank you for sharing opening remarks, Supervisor Joya. Thank you, Ruth. And thanks for your leadership, for your great leadership um, and for in your role with First Five, really bringing all of us together with others. And I think that's so important. So uh, good morning. And I, I wanna say I'm really honored and energized to be here with all of you because you are part of the Contra Costa family of leaders and advocates who work tirelessly and passionately to improve the lives of children and families in our county. So I wanna thank you for that. And personally, and on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, I wanna thank you for being on the front lines of this vital work. You truly make a difference. And thank you for spending your time this morning to re-energize and relaunch the important work of the Children's Leadership Council. Uh, I also wanna acknowledge the efforts of First Five, uh, the County Office of Education, the County's Health and Employment and Human Services Department, along with so many community partners in organizing this event. And Hopefully next time we can all be in person together so we can feel each other's energy and passion. Um, so four years ago in March of 2019, um, I was able to speak at the kickoff meeting of the Children's Leadership Council at the Pleasant Hill Community Center. And I know that feels like a long time ago. We've all been through a challenging time since then, taking care of ourselves and, and serving others. Uh, I know many of you were at that kickoff meeting in Pleasant Hill. At that time, I said that getting together to establish a Children's Leadership Council was an exciting opportunity to change the narrative of children's issues in our county and to build greater public support to invest in more and better programs and opportunities for our youth. Well, then something really big happened right? The pandemic engulfed all of us and forced us to shift priorities to save and protect lives. But we are here again today. Uh, you know, lots of things happened during the pandemic, um, but let me mention two of them that are relevant for us today. First, and you know this really well, the pandemic exposed and widened the disparities and inequities that already existed in our country in our state and right here in our own county. And later on, we're gonna hear a report from Children Now that tells us things that you experience and are trying to correct every day, that opportunities for well-being and long-term success for our children are not equally distributed across our county. When we only look at countywide averages and data, that data hides and covers up the significant disparities and inequity that exists among race, ethnicity, and where you live. And you're here today and you're all working hard because you know that this inequity and disparity in resources and outcomes for our children and families is unacceptable and must end. The pandemic, I think, highlighted why now more than ever, we need all of us to re-energize our work together as part of a network, as part of a Children's Leadership Council. A, a second thing happened during the pandemic. For the first time ever in the history of Contra Costa County, the voters supported a half cent sales tax to increase funding for supporting and expanding county and community health and social services, and other vital safety net services. And that measure raises about $110 million a year. So imagine that. In the middle of a pandemic, voters said they were willing to be taxed more to support the health and social safety net. 
I believe the pandemic highlights the valuable work that government partnering with community can play in helping and supporting families and the public saw that. So we did accomplish one of the things we talked about at that kickoff meeting in 2019. Um, because of the voters in this county, we made some progress in increasing our investment in, children's and in children and families. Measure X is investing millions of new dollars into children's mental health services, early childhood education and childcare, mental health crisis response, more health care for our most vulnerable residents, social service family navigators at low-income schools, developing and operating new youth centers, supporting children with disabilities, closing disparities and inequity by establishing a county office of racial equity and social justice, keeping young people out of our juvenile justice system through restorative justice programs, and that's just a partial list. So thanks to a coalition of elected leaders, labor unions, and community groups, and thanks to Contra Costa voters, our collective investment in children and families has increased. And I think we can be proud of, of the partnership that occurred that led to that. But here's the takeaway for me that I think is really relevant for today. The Measure X effort demonstrates that we, when we work together in partnership, our public and our community-based systems, we can build greater public support to do more for our most vulnerable residents. And I think that's what today is about, being inspired to roll up our sleeves and work together under one large tent to break down the barriers to achieving greater equity of resources opportunities, and outcomes for our, for our county's children. Uh, in serving as chair of the Board of Supervisors again this year, I have made health and equity the main theme and goals for the work that I do, because I think ultimately everything comes down to health and equity. One of the things I've requested to be included in our annual budget documents, and, and those documents come out in a couple of weeks, is a description by every county department on what it is doing to improve equity within their work and how their budget achieves that. So this may only be a start, but we have to start somewhere. And our vision is that the new County Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice will significantly expand the work of each county department and work with the community in achieving real equity and be accountable to the public in doing this vital work. And I don't need to tell you, because you are frontline experts, that the challenges our families face extend beyond any one system. Our children and our families face challenges and obstacles getting what they need within our health system, our education system, and our social service system. You know more than anyone that we need to create a proactive system level approach to addressing the inequities in our community rather than being reactive. I believe that through a re-energized Children's Leadership Council, we can develop a shared vision for child and family well-being here in Contra Costa and translate that vision into actions and outcomes. I know if we were all together in one room, we'd feel each other's energy and wanting to do this important work. So since we're not all in person and we can't shout out loud our commitment, I'm gonna ask all of you for a thumbs up sign that you're ready to work together as part of a re-energized Children's Leadership Council to end inequality of opportunity and end inequitable and unequal outcomes for our children and families in Contra Costa. So do we have a thumbs up on the work, right? Um, so I know we're ready to continue this work and I appreciate all you've done. I think our children and families benefit every day, every day from all your collective work and we can do more together. So next we're going to hear some important data 
from a report by Children Now that identifies some of the areas where we can close the opportunity gap. Um, Children Now has been the leading research policy and, adv and advocacy organization in California on improving outcomes for children and youth. And I think uh, we should all recognize their great work. And I wanna introduce one of their great staff, Kelly Hardy, uh, a senior managing director for health and research and proud to say that she lives here in West County and she's also been active here in West Contra Costa on education issues as a passionate and engaged parent. Kelly, it's great to have you be part of this effort and we're looking forward to hearing your wisdom. Thanks so much, Supervisor. And I am very proud to be a Contra Costan and just thrilled to see all of these organizations and wonderfully engaged folks on behalf of our kids. Um, as the Supervisor said, Children Now is a uh, policy advocacy and research organization. We're statewide, um, so we focus on all of California's kids, but we all know that Contra Costa's kids are the most special. Um, and we're really proud to partner with the Lesher Foundation, uh, First Five Contra Costa and Contra Costa Economic Partnership on this work to better understand the data around Contra Costa's kids, not for data's sake, but to drive action. Um, because that's what we're all here for. Uh, we worked together in 2019 to develop a two-page infographic, and then that wasn't enough. So more recently, we dug even deeper to understand what the data is showing about the past few years and how that can help county partners like you move forward together to close disparities and ensure there's opportunity for kids all across the county. The challenges and disparities that the data outline are not unique to our county, but you all are uh, the special sauce, right? The stakeholders, the resources, the solutions that we have here are unique to the distinctive makeup of Contra Costa. So um, I'm going to cover some of the highlights from the data report as context for the panel discussion around what we do with the data to better support our kids. Now I wanna pass it back to Ramona for a poll to better understand what you are most interested in um, so that I can tailor my remarks a, a bit to, to what's most important to you. Thank you so much, Kelly. So we're gonna ask you to, to wake up and, and use, your, use your mouse finger uh, to respond to the poll that's on your screen. There's a lot of data to cover and so we really wanna hear what is exciting, what is interesting, what is most important to all of you uh, to hear about this morning. And don't worry, we're gonna cover a little bit of everything. All right, the, the answers are rolling in. We're, let's see, uh, mental health and early learning are currently neck and neck. Oh, education is is uh, is getting getting closer. It's overtaking. Oh, we've got a pretty balanced group here, Kelly. Let's see. We'll give you just thirty seconds more to respond. It looks like it looks like we've got a broad range of interest. Okay, get your last responses in there, and then let's go ahead and share the results. Okay, so like I said, we've got a pretty balanced group here, Kelly. So I think uh, I think you'll find folks interested in every piece. Awesome. Well, luckily for you, I love all the data. So um, we we can uh, talk about all the numbers and um, dive in. Let we go ahead to the next slide. So I wanna start with an overview. Who are we talking about when we say Contra Costa's kids? Um, and this is data from the American Community Survey pooled over five years. That's related to the census. Um, and I know that there's many ways to group the regions in the county, um, but this is how we're doing it for this report. And it's consistent with what we did in 2019 as well. So looking at West, Central and East. It's just one way to look at the differences in race and ethnicity percentages across our communities, as well as number of children. Um, and I think the 
rainbow colors are particularly apt here since um, you know we, we are a very diverse county reflecting uh, the Bay Area as well. Um, but there's of course different mixes of race and ethnicity across the different parts of the county. Next slide. So here's a comparison of poverty rates um, that shows up in the report. This is comparing 2018 versus 2020. Again, it's using American Community Survey pooled data. And we use 200% of the federal, federal poverty level as a guide rather than 100%. Um, I don't think I need to tell you that 100% of the poverty line just doesn't just doesn't make ends meet in the Bay Area. Um, and 200% is still very low. It's $50,000 in income for a family of three. So you'll be unsurprised that we see more low-income children in the West and East parts of the county. But the drop from 2018 to 2020 is something that's notable. And that's due to all of your work um, and the work of state, federal, and county efforts to combat um, the economic impacts of the pandemic, things like the child tax credit. Um, and so that's heartening to see. Of course, these numbers are still too high. Um, and we see that there's more poverty in the West and the East. Um, but it is good to see that they're going in the right direction. Next, I wanted to um, show you the, the data report covers some of the negative impacts of the pandemic, like our estimate of kids who lost parents due to COVID, um, increased need for food supports, and loss of child care providers. We also, on the flip side, detail some of the key responses by county partners to meet families' needs, like COVID rent relief, um, the child care relief fund, emergency child care, and of course the Herculean effort for food distribution through schools. Um, but here are some of, you know, some of the negative impacts that I, I know we all feel very deeply from the pandemic. Turning now to child maltreatment, we see that, um, and this is from a report um, from 2021. Uh, calendar year 2021. It's a statewide report that broke everything down by county. So for Contra Costa County, despite the fact that kids had less contact with doctors and teachers and other mandated reporters during the pandemic, um, we see that one child maltreatment case was reported every hour in 2021. Um, and the organization that, that pulls this report together, Safe and Sound, has just re released a 2022 report as well. Um, so you uh, can look that up um, when you get the full report. Um, there's lots of very detailed uh, footnotes that to look at as far as where we got the data from. They also estimated the financial impact of maltreatment at about $320 million in 2021. And that's an estimate um, that they pull together of direct costs, like costs of the child welfare system, um, costs to uh, healthcare related to injuries, um, and indirect costs, such as adult criminal justice costs, um, lifetime productivity loss, um, and, and that type of thing. So for example, they estimate the costs of education to, to the educational system by um, estimating the incremental chance of a child receiving special education following child maltreatment, and um, also estimating the incremental cost of that special education compared to a child not receiving special ed. We also searched for data to illustrate the lived experience and anecdotal um, information about unmet need for childcare. Um, and I'm sure you all uh, can tell stories as well. Um, we see that across the county, care for infants and toddlers is hardest to find. Um, 
We also see that there's significant unmet need for preschool childcare, especially in certain communities. And this is a, a projection of um, unmet demand in 2027, if all things remain the same. Uh, I know that there's work here and also very much at the state level to try to um, improve uh, rates paid to childcare providers and, and other efforts to make sure that this is not the case and that we can start narrowing these gaps. Jumping way ahead, um, looking at high school graduation. So from early education to, to high school, um, this data is from the California Department of Education, their data quest system. And it shows that overall, we have a lot to be proud of here. High school graduation rates are quite high. Um, and it, it is clear though, that there's these intersecting disparities and the county, like the state, like the nation, needs to do better in supporting Black and Latino students, as well as those with individualized education programs, IEPs, and those in foster care. I should note these, um, someone asked me about these little dots. Those are asterisks in the, um, the Asian and other race and ethnicity categories um, where the numbers are too small for students in foster care for us to report those percentages um, just due to confidentiality. And then in the health section of the report, um, we show this map of where children's lead risk from housing, so lead toxicity is highest across the county. So you can see the darker parts of the map are where the lead risk is highest for children. And we know that a history of environmental racism has disproportionately put communities of color at risk for hazards like lead. Also, only 54% of the children in the county with Medi-Cal health insurance were screened for lead by their second birthday. That data is from 2019. Um, and so increasing that number is an opportunity to protect more kids both by, of course, decreasing the amount of lead that is um, in the environments that, that kids are in, and also by making sure we're having this early, um, early screening, early intervention if there, we do see problems. Um, and that data is from the Cal Enviro screen. It's the most recent available data. Lastly, I know that mental health is a really big topic for many of us, especially after the past few years, and certainly you know, what we saw in that quick poll. Unfortunately, there isn't a ton of reliable data on youth mental health, but from what we do have, this is from the Cal Schools survey data, it shows us that female ninth graders report chronic, sad, or hopeless feelings about twice as much as male students and that both groups showed an uptick in the most recent survey, the 2019 to 21 survey. They also had a, a, a um, not, fail, not, not female or male category, but that data was uh, too small to, to reliably report. We do know that of the teens who say that they need mental health help, um, again, this is survey data. It's not amazing data, but it's the best that we have. Um, only about half or so, or even less than that, are actually getting counseling of any kind. So I'll say that again, of the, the teens who say that they need help for mental health, only about half are getting counseling of any kind. Again, this is a statewide issue, and fortunately, there's increased state dollars to begin to better support youth mental health. Um, and so I'm eager to see what becomes of that effort. I know that Children Now and, and many others are really working hard to make sure that there's more attention paid to both mental health and substance use among um, our youth. So I would love to see if you have any questions about the data, knowing that we will, you know, you will get the full report um, shortly. 
and that we're available at researchmail at childrennow.org to answer any detailed questions. And I'll put that in the chat. Um, but I, I could take any quick questions about the data and then turn it back to Ramona and the panel to ensure we have plenty of time to think together about how to use this data for action for our kids. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kelly. I think we've had a very active chat, so I just want to address a couple of questions right off the bat that we will be sharing uh, slides and the recording after the event. Um, and we also want to drop a resource uh, for you into the chat where the uh, data report will be, the full data report uh, will be posted, and you will also have access to that. It has um, you know, even more information than what Kelly shared with us today. So um, let's go ahead and see if there's any questions we have time for. We have time for a few questions. If folks want to um, direct questions to Kelly, you can feel free to put it in the chat box or raise your hand um, to be called on. Let's see. Not seeing any hands. I did see a question about um, from Melanie, wondering if the numbers of refineries located in West County have an impact on higher lead risks there. Kelly, did you did your team look at um, potential causes? That's not something that that I know anything about. Um, I so no, I don't know if anyone else can speak to that. Perhaps during the panel. Yeah, that's a it's a really good question. That. That's a sign of good data, right? It, it it brings up more questions and more areas for, for us to look into, right? I see another question. Do we know if slight decrease in poverty is related to increase in CalFresh and or subsidies made available during the pandemic from Amy? I do think that um, the, the slight decreases in poverty, um, and I will take any chance to cheer on improvements in data. So I realize those are not huge decreases, but they are, you know, they did move in the right direction. Um, I do think that those are because of uh, federal, state, and county actions like, um, you know, not kicking people off of Medi-Cal, like um, increasing CalFresh benefits, like the child tax credit. And you can probably think of others um, that really helped uh, some of the folks who needed the most help. Thank you so much, Kelly. I see I have a hand from Jamok. Would you like to go ahead with your question? Yes, greetings, good morning. Thank you for um, this convening. Um, I, I'm curious about, from the supervisor's conversation about the race, I'm making up this name, I'm sorry, you're, Race and Equity Department or the, uh, that initiative work that's coming out of Measure X. Um, wondering like, are, it, it, what kind of data are you all using um, in, in, in um, you know, because this data is pretty compelling. And so wondering whether or not this is actually gonna uh, influence uh, how you organize your work. And then two, um, it, do you have any of this data? I mean, if we go into other, is it gonna be disaggregated by race? A little bit more. Um, I guess, in particular, I'm looking at the sadness of girls being a girl. Uh, so I'm um, just kind of interested in um, uh, again deeper dives, um, either even around um, abilities and um, racial difference. Did you want me to answer the issue on the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice? I'm sorry, that might not be your section. So yeah, I don't no, know. No, that, you mean my comment about that? Yeah, so we were fortunate enough to raise a fair amount of money from funders, foundations to actually do a community process in making recommendations to the Board of Supervisors about the specifics of how to organize this department. So while Supervisor Glover and I took a proposal to the board, what we really did was had the community, there were thousands of people who participated. There was a core committee. Yes, they've seen all, they, they actually helped present data. Um, so all that data uh, by race and ethnicity and region and, and the, the community process was led by people in the community, not by the county. So uh, I think we, we really, um, we've seen that data, we've heard that data and the community led that process. 
Thank you so much, Supervisor Joya. Kelly, I, I've seen a lot of questions in addition to Jamok's question regarding disaggregating the data, especially by race and ethnicity. I wonder if you want to speak to that piece. I do. Thank you. So I was just uh, looking at DataQuest and um, I'm going to drop in the chat and happy to follow up with anyone who wants help um, looking there. But DataQuest is the California Department of Education's data system. Um, and you can disaggregate pretty well. A lot of times, um, so for example, for this, this, this uh, um, chart that we're looking at right here, the best way to get data that was uh, usable and stable was to use big groups like female versus male. Um, when, we, when we broke it up into race and ethnicity groups, um, we got a bunch of unusable data. So um, you'll find that that's a problem in many ways, but a lots of times um, folks at, at the county level are more looking at you know, what's happening in this, this specific district, what's happening with Filipino students. Um, and that data is available um, when we look at data quests. So I will put it in the chat. Um, you can also, uh, uh, so you can, I'm looking at it right now. You can um, look at English learners versus not English learners, students with disabilities versus not, um, charter schools versus all schools. Uh, so there's a number of ways to, to disaggregate the data. They're just not always something that's usable um, when we're looking at the at the um, at the county level, mm -hmm. and I'm seeing California Healthy Kids Survey has good data around mental health. Um, that is where we where we got this from. It's also uh, it's related to the Cal Schools uh, source that I that I was mentioning. Thank you so much, Kelly. I think um, we're seeing a lot of a lot of more like people wanting to dig deep into the data, which I think right. is very exciting. And so I'm I'm just excited to see this energy around wanting to dig deeper because I think that shows us where's the information that, that we really want in order to drive action and drive better outcomes for children. So I just wanna say I'm excited by what the questions I'm seeing in the chat. We have question. we have time for just one more. Um, let me see. I'm looking at my chat box here. Um, we have a question from Khan Nguyen. What percentage of the ninth graders uh, self-expressed they experienced homelessness or housing insecurity? And is there information on the trauma of homelessness having an effect on mental health of children? Thoughts, Kelly? So unless my colleague Journey can rescue me, I'm going to have to look that up. And uh, but I, I know where it is. Again, it's in DataQuest um, and uh, drop that into the chat for you. Mm -hmm. um, it's very clear that the trauma of ho homelessness um, and we do see there was a recent report maybe yesterday or the, the day before about um, statewide additional students um, being homeless. Um, and that we know that that's not always uh, on the street homeless, but it's doubled up or couch surfing um, and other ways that are unstable housing. So um, that's certainly a really important uh, measure. And again, I, I, I will put that in the chat when, I, when we're going on to uh, you know, the panel discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kelly. And thank you to all of you who had active participation in the chat. It's really, um, you know, th this is exactly what the data is supposed to do, right? Drive conversation and drive action. So it's exciting to see. So I love when people care about data. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Kelly, uh, and, and your team as well for all of your work on this. Um, so we're really excited because we have prepared for you today a panel discussion where we'll be able to dive deeper into these questions. So what we're going to do for this piece is uh, we're going to hear from folks working closely on these issues in Contra Costa County. And, you know, as we mentioned, one of the goals is to leverage this new report, right? It's exciting to see the data, to get our hands on the data. So we wanna leverage this report 
as a starting point for these conversations, which I think, you know, <laughs> we are already running with in the, in the chat, which is amazing to see. Um, and we want to hear how this data is resonating. So we've invited staff from the Children's Leadership Council leadership entities to provide their first impressions of the data presented today and connections and reflections to the data with their work with children and families. I also want to mention that after the panel discussion, we will have an opportunity to uh, talk to each other. We'll have uh, breakout rooms and we'll do group discussions. So we'll be able to hear insights and ideas uh, from all of you as well. We're, we'll give some more dis instruction on that, but I just want to put a pin in that so that folks know there will be an opportunity for, for discussion. Um, and so without further ado, uh, we'll go ahead and get started with the panel. And uh, we're so excited to welcome Natalie Burbick, Nick Bryant, and Dave Fendel to speak on these issues. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves and then share some remarks uh, with all of you. So Natalie, I'll go ahead and turn it to you to introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Ramona and team, for the opportunity to speak a little bit about our work in the Public Health Division of Contra Costa Health Services. I'm Natalie Burbick. I'm the Program Director for the Family, Maternal, and Child Health Program. And our program um, really does uh, community-focused prevention and intervention services um, for families most impacted by health inequities and health disparities. Um, and so we are really working in terms of doing a spectrum of services that look like community oral health, um, prevention and intervention services in schools, to home visiting with pregnant and parenting families, to health education and grief support for those who had um, the most um, adverse outcome. So um, we, we do a, a, a number of services um, throughout uh, the life course and, and support families in those varied ways. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Natalie. Dave, would you like to introduce yourself next? Sure. Thanks, Ramona. Good morning, everybody. It's it's great to be here. What a wonderful forum this is. Uh, I am Dave Fendel. I am the coordinator of social emotional learning support at the Contra Costa County Office of Education, uh, really working to support our 18 school districts and charter schools in fostering um, uh, positive school climate and welcoming environments for students and families. Um, and again, thanks so much for having me here today. Thank you, Dave. Nick, would you like to introduce yourself next? Sure, well, thank you, Ramona. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm excited to be here, and my name is Nick Bryant. I am the Director of Community Services Bureau in Contra Costa County uh, in the Employment and Human Services Department. <clears throat> the Community Services Bureau touches a lot of these data points, and it's by way of children. Right? We administer the Head Start program, and we also oversee Stage 2. Thank you so much, Nick. So, uh, you know, this really is a lead off from the conversation that was happening around the data report itself. And so our experts here are, are going to be able to provide us with some of that context from their on the ground work. Natalie, would you like to go first and share in your, your thoughts? Certainly. You know, when I, um, when I hear these data points, you know, I, I immediately think about um, the ups, you know, the upstream drivers as to how we got here. It makes me curious um, to how we arrived here. It, and it makes me um, specifically want to think about the lived experience of the families that we support in our, in our services and in, in FMCH. And um, when I think about the childcare crisis and that we are already projecting in 2027, these immense shortfalls, um, and my mind goes to black birthing people and, um, and, and families and who are most, most likely on, um, when that inequity is discussed, the, the population that's going to have the most hardship, um, due to that type of, of projected outcome. You know, I think about the actual cost that it's going to have for this family and it's, it's human capital. It's the ability to be 
present for your family when you don't have child care, the, the lack of income, the income inequality. I think about the child care deserts that our families are, are seated in, um, in the communities that they live in. Um, I think about uh, the inability for families to be able to um, plan for child care because a lot of the families that we serve um, don't always have um, consistent work schedule. I think about the divide between family policy and employment policy and how that truly is the failure as to why we're projecting these types of shortfalls in the future and who it most adversely impacts. So um, there's a lot of thoughts and feelings floating around here when I when I look at these data. And I, and I know that these issues are um, multifactorial, they're very complicated, it's not, it's not something that we can easily solve um, overnight, but I do believe that we can do better and it doesn't have to be this way. We don't have to anticipate a shortfall. We can think about um, what we could do um, in our positions and, um, and, and in our communities uh, to get ahead of these types of challenges. You know, when I, when I see the data about um, shortcomings with childcare, I think about, well, what are we doing to support uh, the, the workforce um, that are going to um, be needed, obviously, um, to support those families who do want to go back to work, um, who do want to develop wealth for their families, who do want um, to see their families thrive. Um, you know, there, there's just there's a number of, um, of uh, possibilities that we can take advantage of and leverage when we know this far in advance that um, this, is, this is a shortfall that, uh, that is that of a needed service um, to support those who are, again, most, um, most disproportionately impacted. So those are some initial thoughts when I was looking at that data point that came to mind. Thank you so much, Natalie. Yeah, it's it's it brings up a lot, right? These these data points really bring up a lot, and and those connections to the work that that you know every person on this call is doing. So thank you so much, uh, Dave. I'll go ahead and hand it to you to share your thoughts. Yeah, sure. Um, gosh, what powerful data was in that presentation and. You know, I think that so much of that data was centered around early childhood and, and child care and all of those things. And uh, I'm, wor I'm working in the K-12 school system and it's impossible to separate that out, right? Like, so all of these impacts that happened in early childhood, uh, we saw that slide about graduation rates and, um, you know, early childhood experiences definitely can impact things like graduation rates and mental health in schools. And so, um, you know, I'm the social and emotional learning coordinator and a lot of people think around social and emotional learning as these things like working on competencies like uh, increasing your self-management and increasing self-awareness and relationship skills. And those things are all definitely a part of social emotional learning, but also a part of social emotional learning is creating welcoming environments um, so that our families um, and all families, right? Um, families that are historically marginalized feel safe and welcomed and, and places of belonging at our schools. Um, that can impact things like graduation rates. And so I, uh, when I look at graduation rates, one of the things is that's really highly correlated with our uh, attendance rates and, and chronic absenteeism. So one of the things that we also know is that students with high absenteeism rates in pre-K and kindergarten and first grade are much more likely to not be reading at grade level by third grade, and students who are reading below uh, grade level by third grade are four times more likely to drop out of high school, which then impacts those graduation rates. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing here at the county office is really working with districts on creating those welcoming environments so that, uh, so that everyone feels welcome um, in those environments. There's also that slide about mental health, and so, uh, that's, you know, certainly the pandemic has exacerbated um, feelings of, of sadness and, and, and depression and mental health issues in schools. And so 
one of the other things we were doing at the county is we've got this great team. We talked about um, increased funding, which is one of the bright spots that's going on. We have a Mental Health um, uh, Student Services Act grant that we are in collaboration with County Behavioral Health. I saw uh, uh, Gerald uh, Loneker here. So um, great partnership. We have our WISP program, which is our Wellness in Schools program, which is really supporting um, schools and, and having wellness centers on campus to provide that support for students. There was that statistic about half of students who, who are searching for counseling and can't find it. So we're really trying to increase those services available for students and for families as well. Um, and so uh, not just that, but also one of the big issues around um, mental health for teens is this idea of stigma, is especially um, our, our black and brown students, there's a, a higher degree of stigma in those communities around seeking mental health support. And we're really trying to break that down to make it okay that everybody has mental health. Um, and so making it okay to seek support when folks need it and, and making schools a place where, where people can receive that support. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the data was really powerful. Like I said, started off, you know, that early childhood impacts middle childhood and later childhood. But I also want to kind of like point out that, um, Intervention can happen at any place along the way, right? And so that's a really important like resilience piece. Kids are really resilient. And so even if um, somebody has some adverse childhood experiences, um, it's never too late to intervene when someone has a trauma history to provide support and provide those necessary environments. But schools need to be a place where, where students and families can receive that support and where they feel like it's a place that's welcoming um, and culturally affirming. We can't separate out equity and culture from academic achievement and wellness. Um, so those are some of my thoughts on the data that was presented. Thank you so much, Dave. And thank you for, for continuing to put that element of hope in there as well. I think that you know that really resonates within this this broader conversation and i think supervisor joya you know spoke to this as well that you know the the goal is action we're not uh you know we don't want to just sit around and talk about it we want to we want to drive action so i think that that whole piece is so important let's see i will go ahead and turn it over to you nick next for your thoughts thank you ramona uh a lot of what David and Natalie spoke of, a lot of that. So thank you guys for speaking first. Um, because there's a lot of data here, I actually took some notes because those are the things that I want to make sure that I highlight and get to speak to. I think what strikes me most is really the connection between the poverty levels um, and the need for child care availability and the demand for mental health services. Um, we have, as we saw in the data, we have our safety net programs like SNAP or food stamps and uh, earned income tax credit. And it's had an impact on the poverty and promoting some opportunity for low-income families. And we saw that with the 2% decrease, uh, two plus percent decrease in a 200% federal, po federal poverty level. Those are the data that I wanna make sure I capture. But like we've seen in our local report, those disparities in child poverty across the county, it still persists, right? And that's that's, eye-opening for me, right? We saw that parents are working, it's 90, 97%, right? Uh, safety net programs are being utilized and assisting, right? The 40% increase in the CalFresh. But with the state of emergency in California being lifted, you know, one of the things I think about is that an unintended consequence may be that we see many families struggle once again, right? And we also saw that some of these challenges that families are facing and that they're projected to continue to face um, is childcare. And so we looked at that projection of over 70% of the toddlers' uh, childcare demand will be unmet. Right? And that's concerning, right? Because when we, we know that when parents can afford quality care, it impacts their ability to work and earn a living. Right? And it can also affect the children's well being. And we know that children who receive high quality childcare are more likely to do well in school and have better social and emotional outcomes. So the lack of availability and the cost of childcare, they're gonna remain huge barriers for many families. And that's striking to me, right? That's something that we need to work on. And then it brings me to the mental health piece, right? So living in poverty is extremely stressful and overwhelming. And it can take a toll on mental health. And, you know, and research shows that poverty is a risk factor for mental health issues, including uh, depression and anxiety. So 
These are also going to be barriers for low-income families. And so as I'm hearing the data, some of the things that I'm thinking is, what can we do to address this, right? We automatically go into uh, problem-solving mode, right? And I think about things like increasing access to affordable quality child care for low-income families, maybe investing in infrastructure and facilities and expanding programs like Head Start or increasing funding for child care subsidies. These are all things that we're currently doing in my shop. So it's, you know, it, it's reaffirming that we're going in the right direction, um, but also that we need to improve access uh, to complete services, right? Complete services for low-income families. So meeting families where they are, finding solutions for the whole child and whole family approach, right? They're all connected. And so I think we this got to be robust and it has to be done through a healthy workforce environment to ensure that we're providing quality services. So it's this full circle of care. Okay? Um, but ultimately, I think a lot of what, I, what I'm saying has been said, uh, and I think that we're on track and it's good to see the data that supports the work that we do. So those are the things that kind of stuck out to me. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, so much of what you said resonated and, and the word that really stuck out is robust. We've got to have this robust response. And so I just want to, you know, thank each and every one of our panelists um, for sharing your thoughts on this. I think it really helps to put the data in context and show ways that 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 our partners are already working on this, right? That that this data is being incorporated into these different departments that. Nick and Dave and Natalie represent. And so just wanna really thank you for sharing your insights on this. So now we are gonna have a chance uh, to hear from all of you. So um, we have, um, let me see, we have heard now from our panelists and their insights and how they are using this data in their work. And now we want to hear from all of you. So what we're going to do, the way that we're going to do this is uh, through small group discussion. And we're going to organize these discussions by topic. So you remember that poll earlier in the meeting where we asked you what topics you're most excited about. Now you're going to have a chance to talk with like-minded professionals who are also excited about that, that same topic. And um, you're going to have a chance to start making connections, generate insights from the data, and identify some promising opportunities for collective impact and, and collaboration. You know, I mentioned one of the things is we really want this, this conversation to drive action, and we want there to be hope in this action, right? And so we're going to ask your groups uh, to actually identify an opportunity uh, just one opportunity, because I'm sure there's many, um, but we don't have, you know, unfortunately, we're not we're not together all day today. So we're going to ask you to just identify one opportunity that your group wants to share out. So uh, logistics for this is uh, we'll have small group discussion. You will be able to self-select the breakout room that you want to join, and the breakout rooms will be labeled according to topic. Once you are in your group, identify a note taker uh, who will put notes on the Jamboard. And I'm going to do a little demonstration of the Jamboard in just a second in case you're not too familiar with it. And then you're going to have your discussion. You'll, you'll talk, you'll document in the Jamboard. And then we're going to come back together as a big group. And we're going to ask each group to share one opportunity one sentence about one opportunity that you've identified that your group is excited about and wants to pursue. So now I personally am less, uh, less familiar with Jamboard. So I wanted to make sure that we did a little demonstration. So we're gonna, we're gonna do a demonstration here. I'm going to switch my screen over to the Jamboard. All right, so this is what a Jamboard looks like. And each group is going to have its own Jamboard. And on the first page, the one that you're looking at here. Ramona, we're not, we're not seeing the Jamboard. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Camilla, we're still the seeing the PowerPoint, FYI. Well, we're going we're gonna to do a reset. Thank you so Cam much. Actually, no. oh, Camilla. Was I that the Jamboard? Yeah. Sorry. It no, it's okay. It was the Jamboard, Ramona. 
go for it. Just ignore that. No worries. No worries. It's, you know, it can't be a virtual event without having to stop sharing and reshare, right? So now we've just made sure that it was a proper virtual event. <laughs> so this is what the Jamboard looks like. See, we're not all familiar with the Jamboard, like myself included. Um, and so each group is going to have their own Jamboard to document in. And it looks like this. So you actually are going to have the data from the pr today's presentation to refer back to because we know there was a lot shared and so we want you to be able to reference this and so there's something important which is there are three pages in each Jamboard so when you go into if you choose the mental health group you have page one where it shows you the data page two asks you the first question to respond to where do you see alignment with your work and page three shows that's the second question, what opportunities are you excited about exploring with this community of people who care about child and family well-being who are on the call today? And this is where you're going to identify one opportunity that you want to share out with the big group. So the person that your group selects to um, write notes in the Jamboard is going to find over here this little sticky note feature. And they are going to start writing in here. So if you have an idea about where you see alignment with your work, you'll tell your note taker. Your note taker will pull up this sticky note and write uh, Head Start Support for Families uh, Mental Health, right? And we'll save it. And then it'll show up here, right? So now you've got your sticky note. You can move it all around. You can make a dance, how, whatever you want as the note taker, you have all the power, okay? So I am going to pause here and just see, are there any questions before we go to our breakout rooms? Okie doke, artichokes. So Anna, let's go ahead and uh, launch the breakout rooms. Thank you, everybody. Uh, just another reminder, these are self-selected, so you should have a window pop up with uh, the different rooms to select. All right, looks like people are finding their way, which is exciting. If, you, if you're having any difficulty, feel free to let me or Anna know so that we can help you find your right room. So we click on one of the links and then um and, you, then, and then a um there should be a join a blue join button next to the room you want to join in the links that you posted right and no for so for the to join the zoom breakout room you will have a pop-up that says breakout rooms with the different rooms and there should be a join Button. Oh, okay. I did not get the pop up. Well, so okay. if some folks are are not getting the pop up. So if that's the case for you, if you can put in the chat which group you want to join, then we will assign you to that group. Yeah, it looks like okay. people aren't getting the pop up, right? So and just and just one other tip, um, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, there's a little uh, icon that says breakout rooms. If you click on it, you will get the pop up. Thank you. Like I said, it wouldn't be a, a virtual meeting without some technical difficulties. <laughs> Thanks for hanging in there, everyone. Hi, we need the link to the Jamboard for the wellness group. Okay, we'll get that over to you. Thank you. Anna, I'll put people in the groups and you can 
do the Jamboard link, how about? So again, if you're having any difficulty joining the group, just put in the chat box which group you would like to join and we'll put you, we'll assign you over there, okay? Let's see. So we still have a few folks who haven't joined. If you are looking for a room, go ahead and put it in the chat box and we'll assign you. Welcome back, everyone. I see folks coming back into the main room. I think it's always a really good sign when the clock is ticking down, you know, 20 seconds, 10 seconds, and people are still talking because I think that shows there's some really good conversation going and some good ideas flowing. So um, I'm excited to I'm excited to check out the jam boards um, after this meeting and see what everybody came up with. We're going to give folks just another second to rejoin. So I know sometimes it can take a little bit. Mine came back like faster. I don't remember even seeing that sign. It just popped back. Just suddenly. <laughs> oh, I didn't goodness. finish my discussion. I was like, whoops. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard after. It was like. There were Luckily, nice discussions, though. Awesome. That's good to hear. Luckily, there will be time to... They were probably say, where did she go? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, we're glad you're here. Sorry, it was abrupt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. Anna, do we have most folks back? No. We were 11 in the group, so I'm just surprised. Mine just came in, and I didn't do anything. I just popped back in here. <laughs> so I don't know where did they go. All right. Looks like we've got most folks. I'm seeing that that uh, people wanted to keep the conversation going and wanted to deepen the conversation. So I totally hear you. And I think overall, it's a good sign because <laughs> that means the juices are flowing, the gears are turning, people are excited. Um, 
So we are going to go ahead and move into our last piece, which is just a really quick share out. So I'm going to ask for each group to share one opportunity that you're excited about. Okay. So let's start with um, our well being group. What was one opportunity that your group was excited about? I can jump education. Um, 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 we talked about graduation rates, but also disaggregating that around A to G. And then that pushed us into a conversation about, you know, does that mean college only versus um, ready for trade and ready for work? And then deeper partnerships in schools um, and even pushing down into middle school so that um, young people are like, you know, prepared for work. Uh, and we have enough, we haven't, like, I think the expertise even in, in the circle square is, is like, we're hiring people. And so we know kind of what skills they have or don't have. And so the partnerships with union, but also like groups like, uh, right, it's not writing core, sorry, <laughs> but like the person that takes on the slice of like literacy and critical thinking all that. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And I'm going to just ask for like a brief phrase from everyone because I would love to hear it all, but we are running short on time. So let's hear a quick opportunity from the early learning group. Do I have anybody from the early learning group? I'll chime in real quick. I think overall we all talked about how we can work together as organizations to to you know build this collage of needed resources because to meet the need of childcare, uh, for example, we all have a role to play. So we're excited about diving in and figuring out how to step into this work together uh, without leaving anyone behind. Awesome, thank you, Ruth. Education group, a representative from the education group. A quick phrase. That the the that was the education group that's that that we talked about graduation rates and oh perfect. So perfect. that we're we already done. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. How about health? A quick a quick opportunity from health. Sure, I can summarize. I think the main thing that struck us about the data is the map around lead could be the same map for asthma or pollution or oral health or so many other challenges. So the main opportunity we highlighted was that there are county programs for screening and prevention and connecting people with resources that we just need to expand their capacity and the outreach for those working together. Thank you, Allie, that's awesome. And then last but certainly not least, how about mental health? Good morning. Okay, um, one quick uh, opportunity that we're excited about, uh, using public funds to help support peer-to-peer -peer support groups in schools throughout the county. Awesome. Cool, I'm just feeling so energized by these opportunities. Thank you so much for sharing. And then to close us out, because our work together is not done, right? This is just the beginning of the conversation. I can tell there's so much energy around it. So to close us out, we're gonna end with uh, an opportunity to stay involved. Ruth, would you like to carry us home? Yeah, thanks Ramona. Well, in closing, uh, you know, I know I'm leaving very energized. We want to thank all of you for showing up, as I said at the beginning, as the village that is working for children and families. Thank you for sharing your insights and your questions. Uh, thank you to our presenters, our panelists, uh, Supervisor Joya, and all of you. Um, one goal that we hoped for today coming into this relaunch of the Children's Leadership Council was to really um, you know, spark uh, just in, uh, that motivation to all of you to join the council, to show up at the upcoming events. I think that was a thread that I know came up at our group and I see it in the chat as well. So we have a tangible invitation. We are going to have the first in-person Children's Leadership Council on June 21st from one to five. The location uh, will be uh, announced very soon, but you can stay in touch uh, about uh, the event and find registration information on the link that is on the screen and also was just shared in the chat. 
Um, and as Ramona shared earlier, the slide deck for this morning and the full report, children's data report um, completed by Children Now will also be made available at the link that is on the chat and on the screen. So to be continued, I think we all have a role to play. Thank you so much for showing up and um, I hope to see you all in June. Thank you to the MIG team for helping us coordinate this. Thank you so much, Ruth. And thank you to all of you for your active engagement. This is very energizing. Just so excited to see what you all do next together. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Hi, do you want us to stay on a debrief for a couple minutes or do, are, are we just, we're going to reconvene